Hi, I'm Dr. Frank Blum and I am the Skinny Hypnotist. I'm doing this video because I've figured out a way, a method, a technique that's allowed me to not just lose weight, but to become thin. It's been relatively easy, it's worked rapidly, and the longer I do it, the easier it becomes. I'm not saying I have the answer to weight loss. I'm too old to believe in the answer. When somebody gets in my face and starts telling me I have the answer to something, I put my hand over my wallet. Well, I'm not selling anything. I'm just sharing something with you that's worked so well for me. I find it amazing. I find it shocking. My biggest regret is I didn't discover this when I was younger. I'm 68 years old, which is getting up there. Believe me. I know my body's aging because the hair in my ears is growing more rapidly than the hair in my head. If I don't trim it periodically, it looks like I'm wearing earmuffs. The skin over my stomach and around my elbows is getting loose and crepey. I'm beginning to forget things and then forget that I've even forgotten something. There's nothing I can do about that. But something I can control and have taken control over is how much I weigh. About three years ago, I'm sitting in my office, minding my own business and contemplating the fact that in a few months, I'm going to be turning 65. Big number. I had no problem with turning 65. 60 was the rough one for me. For some reason, turning 60 represented to me my formal entrance into Geezerville. 65 was great. I was going to be eligible for Medicare. My wife and I have been paying a small fortune every month for health insurance with a $10,000 deductible. For each of us, Medicare was going to be great. But 65 was still a big number. So I remember thinking, was there something I still wanted to do? Something I still wanted to accomplish, especially physically. Before I got so old, it didn't even matter anymore. And surprisingly enough, surprising to me at least, there was. I wanted to be thin. Now, I've gained and lost weight over the years like many of us probably have, but the last time I was thin, I was in high school. I wanted to be thin. I was curious whether I could even do it. You know, one last rodeo, and I did it. Now, how I did it has a lot to do with who I am, how I approach things, how I think about things, what my beliefs are. Well, who am I? Well, believe me, I'm nobody special. I don't have incredible willpower. I mean, man, if anything, I'm incredibly lazy. I'd rather drive somewhere than walk. I'll get back in my car to drive from one side of a shopping mall to the other. I'd rather be sitting than standing. I'd rather be laying down than sitting. If I ever volunteered for anything in my life I can't even remember, I probably repressed it. I didn't become thin by using my towering intellect to come up with a solution. My wife and I have a son who was in gifted and talented programs from the time he was very young. In the summers, he would attend these Johns Hopkins programs at local colleges. He wound up acing his boards and attending and graduating from MIT. Well, living with somebody who has a first-class mind forced me to come to the somewhat painful realization I don't have a first-class mind. I consider myself to have a first-class, second-class mind. Hey, if genetics deals the cards and environment plays the game, we do the best with what we've got. I did become thin through dieting. I didn't become thin through dieting. I've been on a lot of major diets over the years, and most of them work to some extent if you stay on them. But invariably, they become too much of a pain in the ass, too many restrictions, good foods, bad foods, counting calories, having to limit portion size. Man, I fall off the wagon and start gaining weight again. Now, I've never been obese, but at one point I weighed 60 pounds more than I do today. I had hypertension, which required medication. Now, it didn't matter what kind of belt I was wearing, you couldn't see it. I made funny noises if I climbed a flight of stairs. And I used to snore so loudly at night, it used to wake my wife up, she said. I carried it pretty good. I've got broad shoulders, so if I dressed appropriately, I wasn't horrified if I looked in the mirror, but I didn't look in the mirror if I was naked. It wasn't that, though. What really got to me was the hypertension. I hated what the pills were doing to me. They had physical side effects and they were making me depressed and, and the high blood pressure was destroying my body. I had to do something. So what I did is I joined a local Y that had an Olympic sized swimming pool and I began swimming laps, a lot of laps. I began lifting weights and I used what limited willpower I do possess to restrict the amount of food I ate and after a while this paid off. I lost about 30 pounds. I was far from being skinny, but I didn't need the damn pills anymore, and I, I felt like I was saving my life. But it was very, very hard, very difficult. It required a lot of effort, a lot of work, 
or I'd start sliding back all the time. I'm lazy. There had to be an easier way to lose weight. And there was. Being a hypnotist really brought home to me the power of our beliefs. Our beliefs literally shape our lives and by extension, our bodies. To a herpetologist, a non-poisonous snake is this wonderful creature to be studied, examined, perhaps picked up. They're gonna to move towards it. To someone who's afraid of snakes, it's one of the most terrifying things they can be confronted with. They're gonna run away from it. And the physiological reactions in the bodies of these two people are gonna be different as well. The herpetologist is gonna be experiencing joy. The other, absolute terror. It's the same harmless snake. Our beliefs about food, about eating, about our bodies, and what we believe our bodies need in order to survive and be healthy, largely determines our eating habits. Our patterns, our beliefs, determine even often, how often we eat, how much pleasure we get from eating. It's determined by what we believe about food and also by our culture. Now, realizing all this, I thought, well, what would happen if I decided consciously and subconsciously to see eating, food, as nothing more than a light, like a biological function of my body? I had to perform a couple of times a day in order to replace the cells in my body that had died and give my body and brain the fuel it needed in order to function. What if I eliminated a lot of the associated crap that went along with eating, things like the emotional aspect, the psychological aspect, the cultural aspect. What if I decided to lessen the amount of pleasure I derived from food and the eating of it? You know, would the world come to an end? What if I decided to see eating as nothing more than a necessary physiological function of my body, not that much different than moving my bowels? Holy shit, indeed. In the morning, after my small breakfast and cup of coffee, I usually feel the need to go to the bathroom. This is called the gastrocolic reflex. If I don't ignore it, I give in to the natural urge to relieve myself. And it is a relief. Come on, be honest. It feels good. You're relieving yourself. You're lighter. You've gotten rid of toxins. You've produced something. It's looking up at you from the toilet bowl. However, I don't wake up first thing in the morning highly anticipating my morning dump. I don't try to prolong the experience by reading War and Peace while I'm sitting on the can. And after I'm done, I don't start thinking, planning, and highly anticipating how soon I can repeat the experience. I go in, I do my business, and I get out. This is how I pretty much approach eating now. I know. This sounds bizarre to most of you. Believe me, I understand. I had a woman come to see me for hypnosis a few years ago who had to lose weight. She was morbidly obese. It was affecting every aspect of her life. She had diabetes. She had hypertension. Her knees hurt. Her hips hurt. Her low back hurt. She hated herself for not being able to deal with this issue herself. It affected her interpersonal relationship with family and friends, even intimacy issues with her spouse. It'd be fair to say that her overweight wasn't just interfering with her life, it was destroying her, it was killing her. Well, when I described to her the method that had worked so well, so easily for me, she looked at me like I was insane. She said, I can't do that. Food plays too big a role in my life. Catch the irony here. She couldn't wait to get out of my office. As she was leaving, she turned to me and said, I feel sorry for you. What I didn't say, as I watched her get up out of the chair with great difficulty, walk to the door slowly and painfully, knowing that her obesity was destroying her, what I didn't say is, I feel sorry for you. She refused to even consider altering her beliefs. And there is a price to pay if you follow my method. You voluntarily give up some of the pleasure associated with food, with eating. This is a price many people refuse to do, refuse to, to go along with, and I understand that. I truly do. But when I think back to how much time, energy, planning, and enjoyment 
I used to get out of food and eating. It feels like my life was out of balance. It plays a very small role in my life right now. And yet, I still have the ability to go to a fancy restaurant, taste when something's well prepared, even great. But there's a disconnect. I have no need to repeat the experience. I eat when I am hungry. But even there, I've broken down my hunger into true physiological hunger, what I call cellular hunger, stomach hunger, which may be real or not, and mind or emotional hunger, which I treat like the bullshit it is. I watch cooking shows on TV, reality cooking shows like Top Chef, Hell's Kitchen, anything Anthony Bourdain does. I really enjoy them, but I have no desire to taste their creations. I get my pleasure in other ways. One surprising pleasure is how wonderful it feels to just be thin, to move through my life with a thin and healthy body, to bound up a flight of stairs, spring up out of a chair, and have to worry about what type of clothes to wear to shape the way I look. Now, I'm getting up there in terms of age, but I feel fantastic. My blood work was so good the last time it was taken, the internist said, Frank, I want your numbers. I'm not saying I have the answer to weight loss. I just have the answer for me. If you have physical problems, you can talk to your physician before losing weight. If you have mental or psychological issues regarding food or eating, talk to your mental health care provider. This may not be a good approach for you. But if you're like me, you may just realize you've been running a faulty program in your mind regarding food, eating, pleasure, your body. A program that no longer serves you. A belief system that's not taking you in the direction you wish to go. I had an 11-year-old client years ago. Came to me for hypnosis. His parents brought him. I wanted to see if I could help him with a particular issue that was bothering him. He was very smart. After listening to my long-winded explanation about what hypnosis is, this 11-year-old looked at me and said, Well, it sounds to me like you're going to bypass my firewalls to reprogram my hard drive. I almost fell out of my chair. I said, son, that's a better description of hypnosis than the one that I just gave you. That's how I see hypnosis, conscious and subconscious reprogramming. Why not consider writing a new program for yourself regarding food, eating, your body, pleasure, and installing it deeply into your mind? I'll help you in any way I can. I intend to do one of these videos every week or so, going into detail about what I did, how I did it, and my theories behind it. If what I say resonates with you, if it's safe for you, maybe you'll want to consider it. Play with it. Try it. In any event, I look forward to speaking with you again next week, and until then, I wish you all the best.